is going to be presenting work that was done by this group at Oracle Labs um, entitled Unacceptable Behavior, Robust PDF Malware Detection Using Abstract Interpretation. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to talk about a work from done with my colleagues at Oracle Labs in Australia and our intern David, who has um, since moved on to uh, a PhD at the University of Sydney. Um, just a quick disclaimer at the beginning that what I'm talking about is uh, research and the um, views and opinions I express are my own and don't reflect those of my employer. So why should we care about um, malwares, malware in PDFs? Um, PDF format is basically the de facto standard for exchanging um, business documents, forms, um, publications, um, this slide deck. Uh, so it's, it's basically pervasive and over time um, many problems with the PDF standard and the implementations in uh, read applications um, have shown up. Earlier this week during the main conference there were talks uh, um, talking about spoofing digital signatures in PDFs and breaking encryption. So when we look at, um, look at the number of CVEs reported against one of the most popular PDF re readers over the last couple of years, we see that there's a like num large number of vulnerabilities um, reported against them. And while not all of those vulnerabilities could be um, exploited by a malware author that um, basically embedding malware in a PDF, um, many of them can, and many of them can lead to remote code execution. And in case you're wondering what the, um, what the count for 2019, for the current year, is it's 320 um, up to now, so it's basically staying at a really high level. So why is there even um, JavaScript in our PDF documents? Um, it's basically a feature um, for document creators, um, the people that create, that use, um, that use generators to create documents. So they can put in um, features like smart forms, uh, perform input validation on basically um, checking the input that you entered uh, to a form. They can do calculation and pre-fill certain parts of a form and they can put automation um, into the document, which could be something like a button that will automatically submit your form to some address on the internet. JavaScript has been available um, in PDF readers for quite a long time. So the first, um, the first time it showed up was with Acrobat version three, and that came out in the late 90s. And it has slightly evolved since then in, in terms of capabilities. And while the JavaScript features that are available to um, document creators are not part of the PDF standard, they're kind of informally specified in public documentation by Acrobat. And Acrobat's PDF reader, you could see as the de facto um, implementation that other um, providers of PDF reader software will then emulate or at least partly implement in, in order to support the same features um, in, in their software. So when it comes to the, the role of, of JavaScript in malicious PDFs, we have seen that over time it, um, JavaScript has been used for different, um, for different things. So in the beginning, um, we saw exploiting of vulnerabilities of the JavaScript runtime in reader applications themselves. Um, then um, exploiting vulnerable implementations of API methods that are implemented in the reader application. And even when the malware author is not targeting um, a vulnerability in, that, in the JavaScript part of the PDF, but somewhere else in the reader application, something like a, a vulnerable image parser, um, JavaScript is still really useful um, as um, a method for heap spraying, putting shell code into uh, somewhere on the heap. So if the vulnerability is triggered, um, the, uh, the, the attacker can, um, can cause arbitrary code execution of the code that has been put on the heap using, using JavaScript. So 
When we started with this, um, when we started looking into this, um, we set out to basically create a filter that would take um, PDF docu documents with potentially malicious JavaScript embedded in them and would remove this potentially malicious JavaScript while leaving embedded JavaScript in non-malicious documents intact. Um, so not to degrade the, the usability of um, what the document has to offer to, to the end user to, uh, who interacts with the document. Um, and our approach for this was to really focus on the embedded JavaScript code. And what we want to do is we want to detect malicious behavior, for example, the use of a known vulnerable API method in some version of a, um, of a reader application based on an over approximation of the program semantics of the embedded JavaScript code. We do this with uh, a static program analysis. And this approach compares uh, well to the current existing approaches um, for malware detection, which all um, in this scenario suffer from, um, from kind of easy evasion techniques. So, um, the simple signature-based um, uh, signature detection that AV engines would do, um, when you have a, a language like JavaScript, you can easily obfuscate um, your strings, your shellcode in many different ways and come up with new obfuscation basically for every single document that you send out. If you use machine learning approaches, um, there's the ability to do adversarial attack attacks against uh, machine learning detection um, uh, using, for instance, mimicry, so mimicking um, patterns found in non-malicious documents with your malicious content. And also dynamic um, techniques like detection in a sandbox suffer from um, an invasion where the attacker will basically try to detect um, whether the target, the, the environment that they are in resembles a sandbox or the actual, um, the actual, the, the reader of someone they actually want to target and only trigger the malicious behavior in those cases um, where they know that their target is not detection but, but the actual victim. And in all of those cases, um, a static over approximation um, that static program analysis can offer um, defeats these evasion mechanisms. So let's look at what our prototype, um, what our prototype looks like. We basically, we have, we have an extractor that takes out the embedded JavaScript um, from the document and passes it to a JavaScript analysis component. Um, note that we would still do this since we're, since we're dealing with potentially malicious um, malicious code or malicious documents, we would still do that in a sandbox. However, the sandbox is not involved in any kind of detection mechanism. It's, it's really just there to, to keep us safe. So, so what kind of components um, did we choose to use for a prototype? So we use, um, for the static program analysis component, we use the SAFE framework, which is a JavaScript act abstract interpretation framework. Um, and an open source project from Sukyung Ryo at Keist University in Korea. So what abstract interpretation um, does, it's, it's a theoretical framework um, for program analysis where we approximate the concrete language semantics with abstract semantics, and it allows us to um, interpret a program not on concrete values, but on an over, on on abstract values which, at the end, if our analysis succeeds, will over approximate the concrete values, thus giving us an upper bound on the possible behavior of a program. And um, in a theoretical setting, this comes with uh, soundness guarantees. And uh, from a practical point of view, the abstract interpretation frameworks for Dynamic languages like JavaScript, they aim to be precise in order to, um, in order to be useful for the analysis of, of these programming languages. We also need a PDF extractor, and um, in this case, we use the commercial extractor um, from inside Oracle, um, which is a multi-format uh, document extractor that specifically to PDF 
um, supports the extraction of all embedded JavaScript of XFA forms of file attachments so that it's basically made to extract every kind of hidden information inside documents, which is exactly what we need to perform our analysis. So note that um, the JavaScript code inside that lives inside a PDF document, it needs, in order to be useful, it needs some way to interact with the user and um, the reader application um, to do anything useful. And such interactions happen via the JavaScript API, which um, they contain an application object um, which represents the reader application. And in this, there are methods um, that allow access to document contents like form fields and uh, document metadata and, and other ways to interact with the user and the, the reader application. So from a static analysis uh, point of view, what we can do is we can model this JavaScript environment by capturing its abstract semantics. Um, and um, we created such a model while we were working um, incrementally while we were working on our prototype um, based on the API documentation. So we knew what was um, what the expected, what the expected behavior and uh, possible side effects of certain API methods were. And we can basically um, model this in abstract semantics or using abstract values. And we prioritized modeling based on the documents in our data set. Um, yes, and our model also um, emulates the event system which exists in um, embedded JavaScript in a similar way to um, JavaScript running in a browser where there's a difference between code that loads, uh, code that runs at when the document loads and code that runs when a user interacts with the document and then event handlers um, respond to those events and um, this can also be modeled in static analysis with um, a non-deterministic event loop. So what we have now, um, if we add the model, what we have um, is our analysis producing, um, producing an over approximation of the behavior. Um, just a quick example how to, to, like a really simple example to see how this model would work. So if there's um, um, this, really, um, this really simple check that could be seen as um, as a sandbox evasion where um, some code checks the version of the reader that this, um, that this code executes in. Um, during static analysis, we um, have in our model of the um, application, we set this version not to a concrete value, to like a specific version, but we set it to an abstract value that um, over approximates, in this case, well, all numbers. So um, as you can see in the, um, in the application model, we basically set it to the top value of the number lattice, which means it can represent any number. And so when the program analysis now at this point um, has to do the comparison between um, the abstract value and uh, would only execute for reader versions uh, smaller than version eight, then this would always be true for our abstract value and both branches execute, which means the program analysis also sees uh, potentially, hidden, um, uh, potentially hidden behavior that would not trigger in, um, in sandboxes if you don't test with the right version. So given the behavioral um, over approximation that our analysis gives us, we now um, have to build a filter um, and for this filter, we consider two cases. In the first case, our abstract interpretation has reached a fixed point. We have a valid over approximation of the embedded JavaScript code. Um, we then inspect the result states and we detect malicious behavior such as a call to a vulnerable, known vulnerable API method. Um, and that's a pretty clear indication that this is, um, that this is malware. Um, we can also detect uh, certain meta behaviors that we've seen in heap spraying, um, in code that performs heap spraying, which means 
um, which usually ex um, concatenates strings over and over to create uh, shellcode strings on the heap or creates really large objects and then uh, converts those objects to, to strings. In those cases, we classify the document that we've, the code inside the document that we've analyzed as malicious. Otherwise, if we don't find any of those behaviors, we classify it as non-malicious. However, in the case that um, our analysis does not reach a fixed point and we don't have an over approximation of, um, of behaviors of the embedded code, which could be due to call, calls to unknown functions, uh, dynamic code execution like eval, um, or analysis simply timing out because um, the program is too com inside the PDF document is too complex. We fail on the safe side and we classify the document as still as malicious because we don't have proof that it is not malicious. So overall, this is um, this is what our prototype does. So we inspect the behavior after program after our program analysis has finished, and if we deem it unacceptable, um, we we'll mark it as uh, malicious, and we can also in most cases generate a good explanation of why that is. So for the example that there is uh, a call to a vulnerable method, we basically point to this call of the vulnerable method saying this, this is exactly the reason why this is deemed malicious, which um, means, which gives you an interpretable, interpretable result which other um, detection me mechanisms don't give you. Yeah, so this is what we have so far. We have, um, we have modeled the reader environment so that static analysis of the embedded code inside, uh, inside a PDF can work. Um, our abstract interpretation will automatically undo um, JavaScript obfuscation that uses um, internal JavaScript internal methods like escaping, unescaping, string operations. So these methods that are used for obfuscation as long as they don't um, depend on any external input, um, our analysis automatically undoes them and um, can still find, find out whether there's um, something malicious happening or not. Um, we can apply our behavioral whitelist and we found that even though this is a quite heavyweight uh, program analysis technique, that it is quite efficient um, using only, taking only about four seconds um, per PDF on average. Um, there's still uh, one problem though, so um, our approach depends, strictly depends on being able to extract um, JavaScript code from a document. If we can't do that, if for whatever reason our extractor fails, um, we have to treat <coughs> the failure to extract as a sign that the document is malicious as well, which would lead to false positives. So why is PDF extraction such a problematic thing? Um, it's a combination of the PDF standard being fairly complex, um, there being many not completely correct document generators out there, and thus the parsers in um, reader applications being quite lenient and error correcting, which um, means that um, a reader application might be able to parse um, partially broken PDF that the extractor that someone uses to do malware detection is not able to parse. So these, these parser confusion attacks do also happen in the world. Um, yeah, so basically we see, we see broken PDF documents with both um, coming from buggy PDF creation tools and from malware authors and we need to find a way to keep the number of um, keep the number of false positives in, um, in this scenario low. So um, to show that, that our solution can still work having this uh, dependency on a PDF extractor, um, we had to combine two of the best extractors we have, so our initial extractor, and to fix structural issues, um, we um, used Apache's PDF box with extra um, with extra changes uh, from us to address issues on how to extract how to extract PDFs that were previously published together with a data set so with, with the how to ex extract PDFs 
um, and we addressed all the limitations listed here, um, the highlighted ones being not in previous literature, but um, found by us in the same data set and then addressed in our, um, addressed in our um, extractor, now extractor pipeline with two extractors. So let's have a look at um, how well this solution performs. So we compared our approach against two state-of-the-art malware um, detectors from academia. The first one being PDF Malware Slayer, the second one Hydost. Both of them are machine learning based um, and using random forest classifiers. The only difference being um, the way they select features um, from PDF documents. Um, for all tools, we count errors, which in our case can only be extraction errors, but for other tools, we, we don't really know the reasons for the errors. We count them as malicious reports because that's well, basically to generate a fair comparison between, um, between those three tools. Um, our data set for evalu evaluation um, contains the um, well-known data sets from, from other publications um, together with um, PDF documents that we collected using a, a search spider to um, not have a maliciously, like, to not have a data set that is biased um, with a high count of malicious examples, which is what we would have if we would only um, use those from um, previous malware, PDF malware papers. And we can see that, that our solution based on program analysis compares, um, compares well to um, the machine learning based um, detectors. Um, we have the best recall at the cost of a higher false positive rate and um, this is basically what we, we expected in that case. And yeah, but we don't, we don't actually have the worst false positive rate. So all of these numbers are in the same ballpark. So um, looking at the, the results in detail, we actually, from our data set, we only have seven false negatives. So those would be documents that are classified as malware by other tools, but not by us. And we manually expected, inspected all of them and found that none of them contain any malicious JavaScript code. So what we think happens, uh, or we think the reason for this is that um, these are partly, um, partly social engineering attacks where JavaScript code is just used to pop up a message for a user to download the actual malware from somewhere. Um, there is um, basically pieces of code that cannot be reached, they cannot be executed, so that would be um, malware that is broken, so it's not actually effective. Um, but it's, we, we, didn't find, um, we didn't find any obfuscation or other methods that, that um, defeated our method of analysis. So, in conclusion, um, I hope we showed that uh, static program analysis um, can be applied to um, a domain like malware detection. Um, we have uh, a program analysis approach that in this limited setting of embedded JavaScript code um, works really well at um, allowing, to ha uh, allowing to get an over approximation of behaviors um, that automatically counters obfuscation and evasion techniques and produces uh, results that basically can be explained and which is something that is useful for malware analysts. Um, we're not saying that this is the only approach to, you should use to detect malware, but um, we have to accept the trade-off between a fully automatic system like uh, machine learning based detectors and um, the robustness and um, interpretability that a program analysis technique can give you. And just some, some final thoughts on the issues that uh, we discovered uh, while we're working on this. Um, considering a stricter mode for dealing with PDF documents and uh, being strict when parsing PDF documents is something um, 
something that has been proposed before in the Caradoc paper at uh, NESS in 2016, and we, we definitely agree with that. We would similarly say that you should be um, that we should be strict with the code that is embedded in JavaScript documents and possibly reject documents that are broken or contain, contain broken JavaScript code if we want to have, if we want to be able to um, give any kind of guarantees um, on whether a document in the wild is safe or not. And I've um, yep, reached the end, so I'm happy to take any questions. Um, the precision of your of your method is, is quite remarkable. Um, besides the approximation that you made on, on the code, which is, I guess, more or less standard, uh, what is puzzling me is how you abstract from the environment, um, because you don't know at all what, what happens around the, the usage of, of the PDF the so, document. So we... Um, we, we basically know that the environment goes as far as basically the, the environment is specified or implemented in the reader application. So there is that the environment is still kind of limited. The environment reaches to, um, to methods to interact with the document, to read from the document, but, but that's about it. There is no, no larger unknown environment. There, there are usually no... Um, no, no inputs to speak of. Um, so it's, it's still, it's a closed environment that we, that we can model um, with over approximations that are, um, that are precise enough for the, the JavaScript embedded code to, to analyze precisely. Uh, yet you don't know how the user will, will act on the document. Maybe so it acts in a, in, a, in a strange way, pressing some funny key, and that that huh? would be that would be the non-deterministic event loop. So where we trigger all event um, all event handlers in a non-deterministic order, but basically the, the values that can the, the values that can be passed through to those event handlers are again limited by the API. Um, I have maybe have an example here. So so you can. You can see how we. Um, so this is this is an event that is passed from the reader application to um, to the JavaScript code. When an, uh, could be a key press, could be a button click, and um, we can over approximate these things here. And um, in practice, it's a pretty coarse over approximation. Um, this is still precise enough to to analyze documents. And rule out these malicious behaviors that we were looking for. If, for instance, the, the user would, the, you could trick the user, you would try to trick the user to type in the name of a vulnerable method and in that way send it to an event handler, um, you would see an unknown string turned into a function being called. So we, we would detect, we would be able to detect that, but again, that's a, that's a fairly, fairly malicious or suspicious um, behavior already. All right. Let's take any further discussions and questions.